The Command & Conquer series is one of my favorite game series of all times, and I have many fun memories of playing these games as a child without really understanding them too much. That was no doubt one of the keys to the success of these games, the fact that you could lose yourself in them without understanding them too deeply. But as an adult, I always had the desire to take a deeper look into these games, and this is exactly what we're going to do now. Welcome to the Iron Workshop, and our first look at Command & Conquer, and the historical background that led to the creation of a game, and the birth of a new genre in PC gaming. Installation complete. Before we get into any aspect of the gameplay, we should take a look at the main characters of Command & Conquer Tiberium Dawn. On the surface, the first game in the Command & Conquer series presents a very clear dynamic between the good guys and the bad guys. Although the fact that the developers have chosen to allow players to play as the seemingly bad guys is not to be taken for granted. So let's start with the seemingly bad guys. Who are the not faction in the game? Where did the developers of the game get the idea of using a global terrorist group as the main antagonist or underdog for the game? And was this a reflection of a similar underground group working against a larger, more organized force at the time the game was being developed? The name for the not faction seems to have come from the biblical place mentioned in the book of Genesis, which is located east of Eden where Cain was banished by God after murdering his brother Abel. This is an interesting fact considering that most of your actions against Nod when playing GDI takes place in the Eastern Europe, Africa and Third World countries, which are outside of GDI influence and direct control. Nod is also the root of the verb Ned in Hebrew, which means to wander, and while this isn't very fleshed out in the first game, Nod is a faction that is mostly focused on quick-moving, quick-striking, and quick-hiding mobile forces. The land of Nod also is said to be outside of the presence of God. Is this God in-game represented by GDI? That's open for interpretation, but no doubt GDI have taken the role of World Police, who are working to shape it in their own view and according to their own laws. While the developers have intentionally kept information about Nod open to debate and interpretation, the association of the Nod faction in Tiberian Dawn and Cain with the Bible has received direct acknowledgement from them in Red Alert 1, a game that served as a prequel to Command and Conquer. Well, General, this temporary chaos in Europe will only help to fuel the Brotherhood's cause. For centuries we have waited to emerge from the shadows and now we will make ourselves known. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and took up residence in the land of Nod. <laughs> you have done well to serve us and for that you should be rewarded. We estimate that the Brotherhood will tire of the USSR in the early 1990s. This segment suggests that the Brotherhood of Nod and Cain had existed long before the events of Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn, which takes place after 1995. The events of Red Alert 1 take place after 1946, and yet Cain is seen many times advising to Stalin himself. It would seem that for the most part of its history, the Brotherhood of Nod operated in secret, slightly changing world events and their location of operation, to advance their goal and gain power in preparation for the day when they can emerge into the open and establish their own world order. This pattern of behavior seems to be a perfect representation of the animal chosen to represent the Brotherhood of Nod, the scorpion. Both the Brotherhood of Nod and Cain resemble the lifespan of scorpions. Scorpions replace their outer skin many times during their lifetime. When shedding its old skin, the scorpion is highly vulnerable to attack and will usually avoid contact to protect itself while it's waiting to grow into the new skin to be able to defend itself. In an interview given by Lewis Castle, one of the founders of Westwood Studios, for the bonus DVD of Command & Conquer the first decade, he mentioned that the idea for Nod was inspired from the global threat that terrorism posed at the time that the game was in development. 
But the story of CNC really came about the, the conflict between good and evil. And to cast that evil character at the time, we really wanted to reach into what was at the heart of most people's fears. And at the time, we weren't afraid of, of uh, the Soviets or anything else. We were very much afraid of the world was afraid of terrorism. And Brett and uh, Edie and Joe came up with this great uh, story idea of why don't we take this really charismatic, megalomaniacal guy who would gather together a bunch of terrorists and create an organization and take on the world. So what was this global terrorism that Lewis Castle talks about in the interview? One of the most notorious terror groups operating in the late 80s and early 90s was the IRA, and their mode of operation resembles very much the way that the Brotherhood of Nod operates in Command and Conquer Tiberian Dawn. Good afternoon. Three mortar bombs exploded in Whitehall at nine minutes past ten this morning. The bomber's target, beyond question, was the Prime Minister and his war cabinet. The attack failed. Good evening. A tipper truck packed with explosives went off in the City of London this morning. It killed one man and injured more than 40 other people. Some estimates put the cost of the damage at over a billion pounds. The Conservative MP Ian Gow has been killed by a car bomb at his home in Sussex. The influential backbencher was driving his car out of a carport when it exploded. Ian Gow is the third Tory MP to be killed by bombers and a fearless opponent of the IRA. For those of you unfamiliar with the IRA, the IRA stands for the Irish Republican Army and was a paramilitary group operating in Northern Ireland against continued British rule on the island of Ireland. And while the conduct of the IRA seems like a classic Brotherhood operation, I had my doubts about the IRA being the inspiration from the Brotherhood of Nod, since Westwood was an American company, so there would have had to been an event closer to home to inspire the developers to make global terror such a significant part of the game. Let's go to Channel 2's Brian Williams. He has just arrived at the scene. Brian, give us the lay of the land from your vantage. All right, I am between World Trade Centers 4 and 5. Uh, the, the pictures speak uh, better than any description I could give you. Lower Manhattan is just purely bedlam. Uh, every other... The 1993 attack on the World Trade Center in New York had shocked the American public and had stripped the conceptual ideas of terrorism. Although the attacks did not claim many lives, it turned the idea of terrorism into potentially daily reality. The attack was planned and carried out by a group associated with Al-Qaeda. This was the first time that America was attacked by an international group whose sole purpose was to kill civilians in retaliation to their government's involvement in foreign conflicts. So did the developers of Tiberian Dawn had Al-Qaeda in mind when they introduced the Brotherhood of Nod into Command and Conquer? It's quite possible, but the Brotherhood of Nod and Al-Qaeda have very different goals and objectives when fighting their enemies. Perhaps this was done to allow the player to relate better to the Brotherhood of Nod and their vision, which would not have been possible to do with a purely terrorist mindset for the Brotherhood. While the stated goal of Islamic terror is the expulsion of infidels from Muslim holy places and countries, the Brotherhood of Nod does not hold religion as its creed. The evolution of Cain as the Messiah of the Brotherhood came much later in the series. Unlike their jihadist counterparts, the goals of the Brotherhood are not as clear and rest mostly within the designs that Cain has for the Brotherhood in particular and humanity at large. Tiberian plays a large part in his desires, and it is only in Tiberian Sun that we learn that Cain sees Tiberium as the catalyst for the next stage of human evolution as a species. Accessing Brotherhood Archives. The Brotherhood desires a world of peace, unity, and eternal brotherhood. The Brotherhood springs from the lowest of places, offering unity and peace to otherwise neglected and abused nations. Tiberium heralds the dawn of a new age. The Brotherhood embraces this age, harvesting Tiberium to further expand our collective beliefs. GDI and the Brotherhood view the benefits and the threats of Tiberium differently. They see a scientific anomaly, a curiosity. I see the future. In their stubborn ignorance, they continue to try and forestall this future.
Now that we know the premise of the Brotherhood of Nod, it's time to take a look at the second main character of this conflict, GDI, the Global Defense Initiative. We are going to have to act if we want to live in a different world. The inspiration for the GDI faction Command and Conquer Tiberian Dawn seems to come from NATO and the World War II allies. The concept of Western nations coming together to face a greater threat is a direct throwback both to how the allies responded to the Nazi threat in World War II and how NATO was a response to the post-war communist threat. But I was curious to find out if there was an event prior to the development of the game, or during its development, that may have directly inspired the developers to create this faction. And when you examine the second role that GDI took upon itself, outside of the containment of the Brotherhood of Nod, it becomes much more clear that GDI is not solely a military alliance established to spread freedom and justice in the world, but that it has other motivations as well. Good evening. Yesterday, after conferring with my senior national security advisors and following extensive consultations with our coalition partners, Saddam Hussein was given one last chance, set forth in very explicit terms to do what he should have done more than six months ago, withdraw from Kuwait without condition or further delay and comply fully with the resolutions passed by the United Nations Security Council. Regrettably, the noon deadline passed without the agreement of the government of Iraq to meet demands of United Nations Security Council Resolution 660, as set forth in the specific terms spelled out by the coalition to withdraw unconditionally from Kuwait. On the 2nd of August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait in what was the culmination of a long diplomatic dispute which began after the end of the Iraq-Iran war. The reasons for the invasion range from Iraq not being able to repay Kuwait, the loans it received to finance the war against Iran, and to an outright desire of Saddam Hussein to control Kuwait's oil reserves and shut down Kuwait as a potential competitor with Iraq for the sale of oil. And this is where GDI, sorry, the United States and its allies come in. In a military operation dubbed Desert Storm, the United States built up a coalition to expel Iraq from Kuwait, secure one of the largest sources of oil in the world at the time, and, of course, to free the Kuwaiti people from their oppressors and spread freedom and democracy. Naturally. The economic aspects of the war between GDI and Nod are not highlighted as much in the game outside of the battle for Tiberium, which we will get to later. At no point in the game is it mentioned explicitly that Nod is an economic threat to the Western nations that form the Global Defense Initiative, but if you look for them, you can find hints that point to this aspect as well. Nod Tiberium holdings now account for almost half of the world's known supply giving the quasi-terrorist group incredible leverage in the London Gold Exchange. On the domestic side... Recent activities include expansionary behavior into disenfranchised nations, high volume investment in global trade markets, and aggressive manipulation of international mass media. These efforts are suspected to be funded by Nod's access to vast Tiberium deposits. Sanctioned by the United Nations, the Global Defense Initiative has one goal, eliminate multinational terrorism in an effort to preserve freedom. While the goal of eliminating multinational terrorism and preserving freedom is a noble one, 
It is hard to believe that in the world of Command and Conquer, the rich and powerful Western nations would allow a resource such as Tiberium to fall exclusively into the hands of another power. One key difference between NATO and GDI is their funding and thus their accountability. While NATO is funded solely by its member states, GDI, at least in Tiberian Dawn, is funded by the United Nations. And while NATO tries to present itself as a transparent organization with morals, a just goal and high values, in reality its actions cannot be sanctioned by any international organization, and thus its only accountability is to public opinion and not a structured organized body that can oversee its actions. The presence of the United Nations in Command and Conquer Tiberian Dawn is an interesting choice by the developers, which perhaps was supposed to play a much larger role in the game and the universe, but ultimately was scrapped, since any force operating under UN supervision is highly susceptible to scrutiny and criticism, a fact that was given its own segment in the game. Delta Sierra Echo to Commander, approaching next objective. Welcome to the lovely town of Bialystok. Dylan sight, huh? A ham SOS from here said Nod forces were en route. Haven't reached Shepard, so I can't confirm, but I'm 99% sure Shep would want you to take Bialystok before Nod does. Backup's on the way, but I can't say when it'll get there. You're on point. Give them hell. War-torn Bialystok. Once a happy farming town for peace-loving peasants. Today, a slaughterhouse. Yet one more casualty in the insane GDI assault against mankind. Another in a series of villages wiped off the earth by the Global Defense Initiative and its misguided leader, General Mark Shepard. And what crime did Bialystok commit to warrant such carnage? Sources indicate that GDI terrorists were convinced the simple hamlet was involved in the manufacture and shipping of Tiberium. When will this madness end? Only one General Shepard and his vision of one world order has stopped. This is Greg Burdett, Bialystok. It's a lie, all of it. GDI wouldn't slaughter children. Was Bialystok a Tiberium Center? Isn't this another incident of GDI reacting to incorrect information? Any comment? Should GDI funding be cut? So besides hunting dangerous terrorists and spreading freedom, GDI's other unspoken goal is to maintain and expand the hold on Tiberium for its benefactors which are the G7 nations who are funding both it and the United Nations. Later in the series, any mention of the United Nations was scrapped and GDI seemed to have lost their dependence on the UN and its oversight. As we have so far seen, the developers have intentionally left the secondary objectives of both NOD and GDI a little bit vague. Nod's unspoken goal is to uplift the marginal nations of the world who do not enjoy the luxury, safety and wealth that GDI's G7 nations do. And they see Tiberium as a means to do that. But their leader Kane has other goals in mind, which are never truly revealed. And Kane's past, as well as personal goals, are kept in the dark. For GDI, the primary outspoken goal is to stop Nod, who they view as terrorists, who will use any means to reach their objectives. But they are also using Tiberium to enrich their benefactors, whose own goals we don't really know. Another interesting aspect with regards to how the two main factions have been designed are their symbols, which seem to project mixed messages as well. If we examine GDI's logo, it has two very clear elements to it. The colors are gold and silver, which clearly reflect wealth and prestige, while the symbol chosen for a defensive alliance is a bird that resembles an eagle with its talons drawn for an attack. Not exactly the most obvious choice for an organization which is supposed to have many protective goals. There are many ways to depict birds of prey as defenders, for example when they are spreading their wings as a sign of protection. But for GDI, clearly this was not the direction chosen by the developers. So is GDI actually a praying bird, flying high in the sky, disconnected from the world, using its sharp talons to hunt the weak and take away their wealth for some unknown interest group? 
it seems like that's left for us, the players, to decide and interpret. And what about Nod? Well, the black and red colors are clearly colors that are associated with authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. The scorpion is overall a weak predator that relies on its venomous tail to paralyze its prey before it could do it harm. Nod chooses to fight smart rather than strong and comes off in this battle between an eagle and a scorpion as the underdog and the one that's doing the actual fighting on the ground, using their wits and innovation instead of relying on some high-budgeted army to do its killing for it. Ultimately, despite their differences, one thing is common to both Nod and GDI. Both are fighting to control Tiberium and advance their goals using Tiberium. Let's take a closer look at what Tiberium is and what inspired its creation in the Command and Conquer universe. Before we talk about Tiberium, I want to focus on another resource that Westwood had incorporated into one of their game series and which no doubt inspired the creation of Tiberium. On this planet, you will die. We have seen it. The planet Arrakis, known as Doom. Land of sand, home of the spice melange. The spice controls the universe. Whoever controls Dune controls the spice. Let's examine the main properties of spice and how it may have influenced the creation of Tiberium. First of all, spice is used both as a food enriching substance and also for the creation of various consumer goods. It is also used to finance the war effort of the three houses fighting for control over Arrakis, the planet where spice grows. Second, spice is harvested using harvesters. The gathering of spice from spice fields is a dangerous task, since the fields are usually swarming with sandworms, which are native to Arrakis. The short-term effects of spice in humans resembles those of various drugs. Spice enhances awareness, vitality, and extends the lifespan of those who consume it. For some it even grants the gift of precognition, allowing them to see future events before they occur. And lastly, spice creates dependency, and the withdrawal from spice can be fatal. Obviously Westwood couldn't just put spice into the Command and Conquer universe, since it belonged to the Dune IP. So they had to come up with their own substance that the two factions in Tiberium Dawn would be fighting over. Let's examine the key properties of Tiberium and what could have inspired Westwood to create Tiberium in the form we know it today. First, Tiberium extracts valuable resources from the Earth and allows humanity to access these resources with relative ease using harvesters for collection and refineries to refine the crystals into usable form. This one is obviously borrowed from spice, so there wasn't a lot of need to change things there. Second, Tiberium spreads and mutates. In Tiberium Dawn, the crystal is still in its infant stages, but is already designated as a life form that seems to be evolving. Tiberium is a new life form. Quite simply put, it seems to be adapting the Earth's terrain, foliage and environment to suit its own alien nature. If this is the case, ladies and gentlemen, we are facing a killer beyond that of our most turbulent nightmares. It is not an exaggeration to state that the future of the entire planet may be in jeopardy. The inspiration for the Tiberium crystal form, as well as their designation as a life form, seems to have been inspired by the 1957 movie Monolith Monsters. was this amazing power that could turn people into stone, that could suddenly turn inanimate rocks, stones, monoliths, into growing, spreading, expanding monsters, 
threatening to engulf whole towns and cities, to bury all civilization under an immensity of weight beyond all calculation. Tiberium symbiosis with humans was only mentioned in Tiberian Sun, when Tiberium regained some of the qualities of spice, such as giving the forgotten and hence stamina, agility, and to some even visions of the future. What's happening? No! No! It's a pentasi! A vision! It is not clear if Cain himself had been directly exposed to Tiberium, but he does speak of having visions of the arrival of Tiberium on Earth, which may have been the first hint to the precognition aspects of Tiberium. The last property of Tiberium I want to focus on is not as vividly shown in Tiberium Dawn as it is in the later games of the series, but that may have been due to technical difficulties. Tiberium has a significant irreversible effect on the environment on a planetary scale. And while clearly a danger to mankind and the environment, Tiberium is collected by both GDI and Nod, and is used to fuel their war efforts against each other, creating a dependency. To me, this is a very important difference between Tiberium and Spice. While Spice is a native substance on Arrakis and does not seem to have negative effects on the environment, Tiberium is an alien form of life to Earth, which clearly transforms or outright destroys the planet. This relationship between a resource that on the one hand allows us to have quick profits, but on the other hand is killing us in the long term, makes me wonder if the Gulf War had an impact in the way that Tiberium harms the planet just like crude oil does, which we are dependent on and continue to use despite its long term damage. Just like Tiberium, crude oil gives us the amazing gift of powering our entire civilization in an affordable way and makes us powerful. But in the long term it seems to be doing the opposite and is actually slowly bringing the downfall of human civilization and its ability to have a habitable environment to live in. While the effects of Tiberium on the planet were briefly mentioned in Tiberium Dawn, it is only in Tiberian Sun that we got to see just how dangerous the substance is and how far it outweighs the benefits in the long-term damage it does to the planet. This is one of the reasons why I love the Tiberium universe of Command & Conquer franchise so much. I don't know if Westwood meant for Tiberian to be a cautionary tale about our use of fossil fuel and the long-term effects of that usage, but it certainly is striking how even when our environment seems to be crumbling, humanity still finds time to invest in killing each other and continue to use what is essentially our own undoing. A big thank you to all my Patreons who support my work, without them this video would not have been made. Videos like these are possible thanks to the existence of free and open information sources like Wikipedia. By supporting websites like Wikipedia, we all benefit from the information that helps create videos like these. This has been the first video in a series about Command & Conquer. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the Iron Workshop to be notified when new videos come out. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.